Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I have a burning message in my spirit this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I prepared myself a, a lovely message, but the Lord began to minister something else into my spirit. So I am going to go with the flow of what the Lord is saying. And let's open our ears and let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We had such an awesome weekend at the ladies' conference. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I believe that the Lord has been taking us as a ministry on a definite pathway. Looking back probably a year now, I can go through the sermons and see a theme that God has deliberately been talking to us or guiding us or leading us into a certain way because he has a purpose. He's taking us somewhere. And the prophet said the ministry is about to land. That means we are about to arrive where God is taking us, where God has been leading us. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm also aware that God has actually been talking to us about consecration for a very, very long time. And yet, you know, because the time is getting closer, the message is getting stronger, and the will of God is becoming more powerful about us being consecrated. So I was just re remembering the people of Israel, before they could enter into the promised land, God said to Joshua, sharpen the knives, sharpen the knives and circumcise the people. Sharpen the knives and circumcise the people. Because the people were out of covenant with God and they could not inherit anything from God. And this is the secret church. When we are out of sync with God, we are out of covenant with God. We cannot inherit what God has for us. That's why we are struggling in our lives. We want certain things. We are praying for certain things. We are fasting for certain things. And it's not happening because we are out of sync with God. We are out of sync with God. When we are in line with God, everything works together for our good. So this morning, I want to take us back to the story of Esther. That's the, the message God has put very strongly in my heart. If the message is for me alone, praise the Lord. I will preach to myself this morning. Hallelujah. You know, I was reading and meditating on the, on, the, on the life of Esther and I saw some amazing principles that are there for us because these things were recorded for us who are living today so we can learn from them. We learn what to avoid and we learn what to do so that we may prosper. So the Bible speaks of the king and his wife Vashti in the book of Esther. And we know that the king had a party and everything was beautiful. And Vashti at her own women's conference, she had her own little party and everything was beautiful. But the time came when the king wanted to show his wife to all his subject and Vashti says, well, sorry, I'm just too tired. I've just come back from the ladies' conference and, you know, it was tough. It was beautiful, but it was tough. I'm too tired to come to you. I can't come. 
I cannot do what you are asking me to do. I just want to rest. And they say, Queen, please, the king needs you come. Go and tell the king, I'm resting. I'm too tired. You know, sometimes when we read the word of God, we read it as a story. That's why we are not learning the lessons that we're supposed to learn. We are not seeing the, the principles behind the story. There's a reason why some stories are in the Bible and other stories never made it to the Bible. Because God is teaching us principles. She was too tired to come into the king's presence. How many of us are too tired to come into the king's presence? How many of us this morning are not in church because we were too tired to go to church because yesterday we were doing something else? Hallelujah. And I've called my message today. It's a new day, a new dawn. It's a new day, it's a new dawn. Yesterday has come and gone, but we are in today. It's a new day, and God is doing a new thing. And I can imagine Esther, she's lived all her life with her uncle Mordecai. They probably had a tiny little house somewhere, and all her life she had nothing. And suddenly, a new day began for Esther. And Esther, out of the blues, without any warning, the king's men come. They are taking Esther. Where are they taking her? They are taking her to the palace. In all her life, she had never dreamt that she could ever enter a palace. She never qualified to be part of those people. The palace was for princes and princesses, and all the important people, let alone an orphan girl raised up by an uncle. It wasn't her place to be in that palace. But God had a destiny for Esther. God had a purpose for Esther. And Esther found herself in the palace of a king. From out of the dumps, they say, from rags to riches. But Esther was nobody's fool. Esther understood that although she was cold and she was now in the palace, the race was only beginning, the journey was only beginning. Esther understood that she had to be chosen. We said, many are called, but few are chosen. There were many virgins that were called from all over the place and brought into the palace, but being called was not enough. You had to be chosen in order to fulfill that destiny. And many of us don't understand that. We think it's enough to be in church. It's enough to be called. It's enough to be a number in a church and be proud that I belong to a church. But we don't understand that the word of God says many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. The majority of us never fulfill our destiny because we became complacent. Esther was a woman on a mission, a woman of understanding with a purpose. She knew why she was in the palace. She knew that a whole nation of people were dependent on her not being in the palace, but being chosen to be queen in the palace. There is a difference, a huge difference. So, you know, the Bible says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So Esther, being in the palace, she didn't use any cleverness. You see, that's the problem with us. We are very manipulative. 
We want to get to the top. We manipulate everything. We, we try to wiggle our way and push and shove and do everything in order to get where we are going. We want to shut everybody down, silence every, every opposition and, and bulldoze our way to the top and you say we have made it. No, you haven't. Esther didn't have to fight anybody. Esther didn't have to, 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 to war with any of the other virgins. Esther understood all her life she had a consecrated life to her uncle Mordecai. Esther did whatever Mordecai told Esther to do all the days of her life. Esther had been under submission. Now you may not see what difference it makes. Now you get all these young women. They come from different backgrounds. Some of them, all their lives they've done what is right in their own eyes. All their lives they have never learned what it is to live under submission, to walk under submission. And every time when you try to bring them under control, they fight and they resist with everything they have. Hmm. I mean, we have children in our homes. They, 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 my, my, my parents want to control my life. Yes, uh, I, I, I have my own ideas and I, I have my own plans and my parents think they know better than me. They want to control my life and I refuse to be controlled. I am doing what is right in my own eyes. The attitude of these maidens was to do what was appropriate in their own eyes. But Esther was different. She had learned principles. She learned how to honor. She learned how to respect. She learned how to submit under Mordecai's house. Now she comes into the palace you know, you cannot change who you are when you allow principles to get into your spirit that you become those principles. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So this was now Esther's life, a life of submission, a life of consecration doing whatever she was asked to do without questioning, doing whatever she was told to do without questioning. It was part of who she was. So she enters palace. And Esther is just being Esther. The other girls are just being themselves too. Now, let's go to the book of Esther, chapter 2. I want to show you something. So I'll go back a bit. Extra chapter 2, I'll read from verse 8. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Hagar, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Hagar, the custodian of the women. Now the young women, the young woman pleased Hagar, and she obtained favor. Listen to this one. So he readily gave her beauty preparations. He gave her more than the allowance which she was supposed to have. That he means he gave her more than what the other girls received. She obtained favor because she pleased Hagar. 
Now I want you to concentrate on that. Hagar is the custodian of all these virgin women. He is watching them. He is studying them. Some of them come from well-to-do families, wealthy families. Their name means everything. Some of them, their beauty is a ticket to wherever they want to go. So they come into the palace with their own thinking. And they look at Hagar. Can you get me a cup of tea, Hagar? Oh, Hagar, where is my soap? I've run out. Oh, Hagar, can you do this for me? I'm too tired today. I'm not coming to the meeting. Hagar this and Hagar that. And Esther is coming being very polite, very respectful to Hagar. And Esther said, please, Hagar, can I have this? Is it okay for me to do this? Are you happy for me, Hagar, to do that one? And Hagar is noticing there is something very, very special about this girl. Now remember, Queen Vashti lost her destiny because of self-will and pride. Now the king is not duplicating another Vashti in the palace the queen is looking for the opposite of what his wife was like. So Hagar knows his job is not only to make these girls beautiful. His job is to observe their character and their nature. And then pick the one with the right character, the right nature to become the next queen in the palace. That was Hagar's job. But these virgins didn't understand that. They didn't see that. They just thought he was just a servant. He was there to do their bidding. And their pride got in the way. I can imagine them choosing, oh no, 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 I don't want that. Take that away. Can you give me this one? No, 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 I'm having none of that one. Can I have this one? You know, when you begin to look, when you begin to think, it was 12 months of preparation for these women. 12 months of pre preparation. Why preparation? Why did they need 12 months of preparation? Because it tells us in chapter, in verse 12, each young woman's turn came to go to the king Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying the women. Now I wondered. These women were chosen because they were beautiful. Did they need 12 more months to beautify them? When they were chosen for their beauty already. That's where they missed it. It was not the outward beauty that the king was looking for. It was the inward beauty that the king was searching. Yes, the outside was important, but not as important as the inside. So, what was this preparation? Why did they have to have all these months of putting oil of myrrh and perfumes and everything? It was to get rid of the smell of the flesh. Have you ever sat next to somebody who didn't catch a bath in the morning or for a few days for that matter? And when they lifted their arms, you collapsed. The human body has an odor, a smell. We call it the flesh, the smell of the flesh. God hates the smell of flesh. 
That's why in the tabernacle of Moses, God says to Moses, make sure that the priest puts on certain material so there's no sweating. So he doesn't sweat and smell. God hates foul smell. So they had to get rid of the smell of their flesh. That's why for 12 months they were put in oils and put in perfumes so that the flesh smell will completely disappear when they come before the king. There is none of the flesh around. They were being purified to remove all impurities from their skins. Take out all the blackheads and the pimples so that they look perfect. Why? Because they were being consecrated for 12 months, being set apart for the use of the king. Those women were never going to be used by any other men but the king. They were being prepared into vessels of honor that would be fit for the king's use. Now many of us do not see these principles. We do not understand that God hates the flesh. We come in the flesh to worship and God turns his back from the worship because all he can smell is your flesh. You come in the flesh to pray and your flesh stands in the way. The stench of your flesh is so much, it is an insult in the nostrils of God. That's why he says, be ye holy, for I am holy. He has a portion, the Holy Spirit, to look after the virgins. That means the church of Jesus Christ. And many of us have not understood the role of the Holy Spirit within the church. We don't understand, just like these women did not understand Hagar's role in their lives. They just saw him as a worker, at their convenience. And that's how we treat the Holy Spirit. He's there for our convenience. Holy Spirit, come do this for me. Holy Spirit, come do that for me. Holy Spirit, do that. When the Holy Spirit say, can you do this? No, 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 sorry, I don't have time for that. What you don't understand is that the Holy Spirit is not your servant. He is God's servant. He is there to give you what you need in order for you to achieve your destiny. He is there to ensure that you have all the requirements for you to be able to come and stand before the king blameless. But some of us are saying, Holy Spirit, I'm having none of that. I'm not having that. You're not taking away this. I've always had this pimple sitting right here. It's my beauty spot. And I, I love it. I like it. So you're not removing it. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. No, 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 no. I refuse to put on those shoes. My shoes are better than the ones you are trying to give me. I'm sticking with my shoes. They are expensive. I love these shoes. But you don't understand that there's a special shoe that has been made for those who are going to be chosen. You don't understand there's a gown that is given to those whom Hagar sees as fit to be chosen. So you go and say, no, 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 no. That gown is too dull. I want the one with glitters. I want to walk in, in style. I want to glitter. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. What was Vashti's crime? What did she do? Her crime was self-will. 
self-will. She lacked submission. She didn't have a submissive spirit. She was very strongly willed, wanting to do her own way. She failed to honor the king's servant. She failed to honor the king before people. Are you honoring King Jesus before men? You know, many of us don't understand. Do you know, Andrew, the people out there whose salvation is dependent on you? Esther understood that the nation of Israel for its continuity, it depended on Esther being successful, Esther being chosen, not just being called, but being chosen. The other girls didn't think that it mattered. They were in it for themselves. But Esther wasn't in it for herself. She was in it for the nation. The problem with us today we want God's power, but for me, for myself. You don't want God's power for the nations. You want God's power for yourself. You want the anointing so that you can show off to people. You want the anointing so people can see how anointed you are. And when you pray and one person falls down, pride comes up. Your ego becomes greater and greater every time. And there's no room for God. But you see, Esther was aware it was nothing to do with her. It was about the nation of Israel. It was about the destiny of a nation. We are here because we are called. But when we are chosen and God puts his power on our lives, put the gifts on our lives, they are not for show off. They are not for you. They are not for me. They are for the nations of the world. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes should not perish. But how will they believe unless somebody tells them? How will they know unless they are preached to? That is why we don't see power in our lives. That's why God is not moving in our lives, in our churches, because we are wanting the power for selfish purposes. We want power. But what do you want God's power for? Because the power is to equip you to go out into the heathen world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power is there for you to heal the sick, cast out the devils. It is not fair so people can bow to you it is not fair so people can clap hands for you. It is not fair so you can feel big. Esther understood. Her being in the palace was not for herself. It was for the people. That's why when the time came, Mordecai brings you instructions. Now Esther, the time has come. Go to the king and plead for the people. Nothing unclean can come into God's presence. When the time comes where you are needed to step into God's presence and intercede and stand in the gap for someone's life and stand in the gap for a city, for a nation, for a family, for a people, you find that you are unable to do it because... Hmm, Esther says, do you know, no one goes to the king without the king calling them. If I go, I will certainly be killed. But nevertheless, this is the heart of a servant, the heart of a consecrated person. This is the heart of somebody who is submissive. Esther will never cross Mordecai's word, even if it means she's putting her own life in danger. She said, I know I'm putting my life in danger. I know there's a possibility that I'm going to get killed. But because 
Mordecai demands that I do this thing, I'm going to do it. But please stand with me in prayer while I go in. Pray with me. I will fast. I will pray. And then I will go to the king. But I need you to stand with me. I need you to pray with me. Because this is my mission. And Mordecai said, tell Esther, this is her mission. This is the crunch of the reason why she's in the palace. If she fails to do this, God will raise somebody else to take her place. Do you know many of us, other people have taken our places? Because we refused. When the time came, when God says, now is the time for you to step into that position. You said, I'm not ready. You said, no, I'm afraid. You said, no, I'm going to be slaughtered. You said, no, people are going to mock me. People are going to laugh at me. And you said, no, I'm not going to do it. And the, the, then Mordecai says, Esther, how do you know if you have been called for such a time like this? This is your hour. This is your moment to count for some in the kingdom of God but if you choose not to do it God will sideline you and use someone else you see for too long we have fooled ourselves we have lied to ourselves and we have told ourselves that you know if I am not doing it then God is not going anywhere you see that's why pride is killing us isn't it and sometimes we think, I'm going to sort them out. I want them to see how important I am. So I'm going to sit at home for three weeks and not come to church. And they're going to see how things are going to go awkward. Then they will know they're going to be calling me. Everyone's going to be calling me. Where, where are you? Come, come, come. The church is not the same without you anymore. That is flattery and that is a lie. Whether you are there or not, the church of Jesus is moving on. Whether you are there or not, the church is moving because God will replace you with someone who is willing. If you are not willing, God will raise up someone else to take your place. He will raise up another to take your position. So Esther said, yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Because Esther was so obedient, so submissive, so respectful, so honoring, she found favor in the eyes of Hagar. And the Bible says Hagar gave her more than what she, she was required to have. You know, I laugh sometimes. We are singing, we want more of you, God. We want more of you. And we sing and we clap and we make it louder. You know, the flesh can get away with so much. No, I'm telling you. The flesh can get away with so much. You can jump and scream and fall on the floor and lick the dust and do everything. And God is standing there and shaking his head. And saying, away with your, your music, away with your sermons, away with your prayers, away with your hypocrisy, away with everything because you are giving me lip service, but your heart is not in the right place. You see, God is interested in the heart. He doesn't care about what we do. Talent can get you very far, you know that. Charisma can get you very far, you know that. But without God, you are nothing. Without God, you achieve absolutely nothing. I never forget the story that was told that a man came in and started to recite Psalms 23. And people were standing on their feet and going, preach it, say, preach it, hallelujah, amen. And they were shouting and jumping and the man was going and they were clapping hands, preach it, preach it, preach it. And then another man came, opened Psalm 23 and began to talk about Psalm 23. The same crowd of people began to weep. There was weeping in the house. 
be some spectator say I don't understand it's the same scripture it's the same word how come when the other one preached people were jumping and dancing and shouting preach it preach it preach it and yet when this one is preaching the same word people are weeping the difference was one had the Holy Spirit and the other had the flesh on. The one with the flesh excited the flesh of the people. They are shouting, preach it, hallelujah. They never had a word to say it. But the one with the Spirit of God, when they spoke the word of God is like a hammer. It breaks down the heart of man and it penetrates like a sharp sword and man began to feel the pain and man began to weep just like in the day of Pentecost when Peter began to preach men started shouting men and brethren what shall we do to be saved you know we, we want to see people clapping don't we if you preach and people don't clap and don't shout, you go home very disappointed. It's true, I'm not lying, am I? Those who preach say amen. Because it's the truth. You go home disappointed because you, you go home and the devil start telling you your sermon wasn't good enough. You see, nobody clapped, nobody shouted, nobody said hallelujah, nobody said amen. The house was silent, even a pin could be felt dropping down. Even the naughty children did not move. And then the devil says, you see. And then you go away, next time pastor say, preach, you say, you oh, know, pastor, I'm working this weekend, I'm not able to preach. Because your confidence is gone. Because what you don't understand, the reason why they were quiet is because the word was hitting home. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When we please the Holy Spirit, because he looks into our hearts and he sees the right motivation. He sees the right attitude. He sees the right spirit. You don't need to be eloquent. You don't need to be an eloquent speaker. You need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You don't need to have the most beautiful voice in the world to lead worship. You need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You can stand there and croak with your ugly voice and demons tremble and people begin to fall and they begin to scream because the power of God is what is working. It is not about my ability to preach. It is not about my knowledge of the scriptures. It is about the Holy Ghost being in action. Too many people are using head knowledge. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. A form of godliness, but we deny the power of God. You know, that clock is not quite right. So, some... 11 minutes to 1. Okay, I want to finish at 1. So just give me a thumbs up when it's time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, many of us, instead of spending hours in prayer, we spend hours practicing. You know, they will tell you, stand in the mirror and preach to the mirror. Preach to the mirror. Practice. Stand in the mirror. You know, if you, that's what you're doing, pride is not very far from your heart. The time you spend in the mirror, looking at yourself, fixing your mouth so that the smile is in the right place. That time 
time you should have spent in the presence of God Almighty, weeping before God, crying out to God, Father, breathe your breath upon your word so that those that hear it are transformed, so those that hear it are changed. The Bible says signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the word. Why aren't we seeing signs and wonders? Because we are preaching our own word. We are speaking our own thing. Yet God says, my word that has gone out of my mouth will not return void, but will surely accomplish what I'm sending it to do. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you and you approach a person with cancer and you say, cancer, in the name of Jesus, I command you now leave the body. Because that is from the Spirit of God. The cancer will bow down. The cancer will leave that body. Because the Spirit of the Lord is the one that is speaking. He says, when you say to the mountain, move, the mountain will move. As long as it's not you. It's not your word that counts. It's not how you feel that counts. You know, I'll never forget one time I was in a conference. And this woman... She had the most powerful voice you have ever heard. She began to sing. And everybody was mesmerized by her voice. Then she wanted now to show just how high that voice could go. And she took it higher. And she took it higher. And she took it higher. When she was right at the top, she broke down and fell on the floor and started weeping. And people wondered, what happened? When she got up, she says, the Lord rebuked me. Right there, I was showing off. I stopped ministering and I wanted to show off my voice. I wanted you all to know how high I can climb. And God brought me down. God will have none of the flesh, people. This is not the moment. This is not the hour for the flesh Consecration is a time of preparation. And preparation comes before the new day begins. You can never step into your destiny without consecration. You can never step into the purposes of God without consecration. You may get away with it for a little while in your flesh, but you won't go very far, believe me. You won't go very far. So we need to stop being dependent on our own beauty like those girls. They depended so much on their beauty. And in their own hearts, they were 100% sure they were going to be chosen. I can imagine the last minute before the catwalk, they look in the mirror and they say, Mirror, mirror, who is the most beautiful of them all? You, my lady. Say yes. Nobody's as perfect as me. I look so beautiful. Oh, in my dress, I'm going to knock them down. And then they, they take the stage. You know, you prepare yourself, Andrew. Today I'm going to knock them down with my sermon. <clears throat> and then you come. You take the stage. You say, people! Then the Bible says, an empty tin make a lot of noise. God is saying, no longer. He says, I'm doing a new thing. Forget about the old. Forget about the past. I don't care how anointed you were yesterday. I don't care how many dead people you raised yesterday. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. God is doing a new thing. He says, forget yesterday. Forget what happened yesterday, good or bad. Forget about that. The problem with us, we never live behind the past. We drag the past along with us into our future. People, listen. Listen. How do I know I'm dragging my past with me? When you keep on about things that happened yesterday, 
you are still carrying your past with you. Yesterday is gone. Yesterday is gone. Whatever happened yesterday, today it's like it never happened. That's what God wants. It never happened. What happened yesterday, it never happened. If Andrew did something to me yesterday, today is a new day. Andrew didn't do anything to me today. So let's walk today, Andrew. Let's forget about yesterday. We need to leave the past behind. We need to leave yesterday behind as we are stepping into the new day. Hmm. You know that the devil is a liar. I was ch ch checking with pastor, chatting with pastor. I was talking about somebody that has passed and gone on to be with the Lord. Not has gone on, take out the other part. I don't know that he's with the Lord. <laughs> They have gone on. But what I know was that they started well in the house of God. Then they backslid and went full force into the world. They died in the world. Why did they backslide? They met an unsaved woman. And they decided to get married. And after they got married, they were complaining. You know, this woman, they drink too much, this family. You know, they're buying booze and bringing it into my house. I keep trying to tell them, I used to drink, I'm now a Christian, I don't want to be here in my house. But they're always having parties in the house. And before you knew it, he was the king of those parties. And before you knew it, he was dead at a very young age. But now, that widow is now in church full time. I'm saying, wow! She pulled him out of church. He died outside. Now she's in church. And guess what's going to happen on the judgment day? He's going to be saying, but God, this woman took me out of the way. Now she's there and I'm in hell. What is going on here? I'm trying to tell you, don't let any man fool you. Each man for himself and God for us all. You are going to stand alone on judgment day. Your friends will not be there. They may repent at your funeral. And what happens to you? They deceived you. They misled you. They misguided you. They caused you to walk in rebellion. They caused you to walk in error. And then you are dead. And they discover their error. They repent. And you are in hell. And they are in heaven. Then you try to say, but God, this is not fair. God says, oh, it is very fair. You had a choice. You made your choice. You made your choice. Esther made her choice. And she chose to be humble. She chose to be submissive. She chose to be led by Hagar. She accepted Hagar's discipline. She accepted the garments that Hagar gave to her. And she says, whatever you think is appropriate, Hekka, I'll take it. That's the attitude that we should have. Holy Spirit, whatever seems right in your eyes, I'll have it. Because the Bible says, who knows the mind of a man? Who knows the mind of God but the Holy Spirit? You don't know God. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. So what is right in your eyes is not necessarily right in God's eyes. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, then we enter into the truths of God. That's why he says those who are led by my spirit, they are my sons and my daughters. Esther was led by the spirit. And she saved the whole nation of Israel. You know, I always comfort myself when the enemy is chasing me. And the enemy is relentless behind me. I always say, you know what happened to Mordecai? Because the enemy of Mordecai, Haman, I'm finished now. Because some of us, 
we are spending too much time praying about our enemies, focusing on our enemies instead of praying about the will of God and focusing on the destiny, focusing on the purposes of God. You know, Mordecai was busy pushing Esther to the king while, while Haman was busy preparing the gallows for Mordecai. He built the gallows for Mordecai, made, it ve made the knife very blunt so he would feel the pain because it will take long to chop his head off. And then the king calls him and says, what must be done for the man that pleases the king because he was so delusional. Some of us are so delusional. We think that we are pleasing God. We think that we are the star in God's eyes. That's why the Bible says, think soberly about yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself. He thought too highly of himself that he says, Oh, king, that man must be given the king's horse and put on the king's robe and ride on top of the king's robe. The king's robe. What do you think the king is thinking? So you want to be me. You devil, the spirit of Lucifer, who says, I'll be like the most high. Give me the king's horse, give me the king's clothing, and let me parade before men so they can see that I have been promoted, so they can see how great I am. The king says, well done, that is a good idea. And he went home thinking, wow, ha, ha. but his wife says, hey, husband, if not a car is a Jew, then you are about to fall flat on, his, on your face in front of him. And Mordecai is the one who was riding on the king's horse. And Haman is the one who had to face his own gallows. Whatever the enemy means for evil, God works it out for your benefit. You don't have to strive with people. You don't have to fight with people. You don't have to defend yourself with people. You don't have to do anything. Just stand right with God. Continue doing what is right. Continue seeking his face. Continue praying to God. Continue worshiping God. And you will see your enemies fall before you. Hallelujah. That's the living God that we serve. And he is calling us to that place, church. He is bringing us to a place of fruitfulness. No longer are you going to be saying, you know, we, but we never practice it. And now we are all guilty here. So don't even say amen. Because when was the last time we had baptism? Before we were baptizing almost every month. What happened to that? Evangelizing. Stopped talking to people. We stopped doing anything. Yet we come here to church and we pretend. And we sing the songs. And we talk the talk. But if God were to ask you, 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 as an individual, how many souls have you brought into the kingdom of God in the last five years? Not one year, five years. Can you number them on my fingers? Can you? stepping into a new season and this new season is for the cold ones and the cold ones are going to bear the fruit they are going to save nations they are going to save lives you are going to reach out to the people whose lives depend on you for salvation you are going to talk to people who are waiting for you to talk to them and you will bring them to the house of God so they too can enjoy what you are enjoying. Failure to do that is like Esther failing to step into the presence of the king to intercede for the nation. And the nation of Israel would have perished. Those Jews would have been slaughtered like animals if Esther had not stood in his place. And God says, I sought for a man. I sought for a man. 
that will stand in the gap and build a hedge for the land that I may not destroy the land. Are you that man this morning? Are you that man that God is searching for? Are you that man that going to say, if I perish, I perish, but I'm answering the call. I'm going to step out and I'm going to step into the presence of the king. There's a price to pay to be in the presence of the king. That's the challenge I leave with you this morning. You can't operate from outside. You got to step into the king's presence. Too long we have been operating from outside. But now we need to step into the presence. And when we step into the presence, all flesh falls away. When all flesh falls away, the unity of the brethren will be the most amazing sight you have ever seen. The presence of God will be so thick in the place. Some of you have never really been in the presence of the Lord. And so excuse some of us for being frustrated in the spirit. Because we know when there is a presence. And we know when we are trying to put it on. There is a difference. And I'm done trying to put it on. I'm tired. I'm tired of cycling. I want to land, church. It's time for us to land. But we're not going to see the power of God when we are doing nothing. I mean, all of you here, you've been prayed for, delivered, everything. I mean, you want us to keep praying for you and delivering you when there's nothing more to deliver. We can't deliver you from your own flesh. Because what's remaining is your flesh. Don't blame it on the demons. The demons are not even there. It's your flesh that is the problem. You have to deal with the flesh. What we need is you people with new problems so that you can see the power of God at work. People say, oh, these days there's no power in the church. No, the power never left. But there's no, there's no reason why the power should operate because the power is not there to entertain you. No, it's not there for entertainment. It's there for a specific purpose. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.